Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'm Mayor Jefferson Wagner, Mayor of the City of Malibu. Thank you very much for attending. I have a script. I'm going to read from it. It's three short, brief pages. Uh, thank you for joining us for the Building Fire Resilient Homes and Communities Innovations and Lessons from Australia, hosted by Tree People. Many of us are familiar with Tree People, and uh, most of us in the room here are very well educated, and that's why you came tonight, because you're going to look at other factors of keeping these trees alive and how they are useful in the land, landscape and as well as fire resiliency. Resilience is, resiliency is the capacity to adapt and change conditions and to regain vitality in the face of adversity. Our community is strong and by rebuilding resiliency, we will become even stronger. The Resilient Malibu Workshop Series is part of the city's efforts to offer support and resources to residents impacted by the Woolsey Fire and to help our community become better prepared for the future. Tonight we will learn about innovations and lessons learned from Australia's rebuilding efforts after their catastrophic fires in 2009 and the best practices in resilience design using materials and landscape. We'll have a Q&A after the panel discussion. We have Craig George from the city here, our techno guy. Technical questions here. Okay, and uh, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment and announce our next Resilient Malibu Workshop, Rebu Rebuilding Resilience, a hands-on workshop with green architects and engineers, Saturday, April 27th, 2 p.m. to 4.30, here at City Hall, same room. That working workshop is by Global Green and the United States Green Building Council. We hope you will come back and join us for that event as well. Also, Metro is holding their meeting next door, so if you're in the wrong room, this is resiliency. Metro is next door. Uh, so I'm gonna hand this off to Cindy in just a moment. Um, I'll be here for the event uh, afterwards. If any of you have questions about uh, controlled burns or prescribed burns, uh, I have a great deal of knowledge about how that works. I'll be happy to discuss the details of that so that your concerns uh, in the future when the county and the city collaborate on the 435 acre uh, burn up near Big Rock. We can tell you about the details of that off site uh, and we'll do that after this meeting. So thank you very much for coming and getting a full house. Enjoy the treats. I don't see those nice of treats very often, especially here when you notice the sign outside said no food or drink. So we're all violators tonight. Here you go, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So again, I'm Cindy Montañez. I'm CEO of Tree People, uh, and I've been there now for three years as CEO, but I actually have a house here in Topanga. So I also, like you, live in the Santa Monica Mountains. And we just want to say thank you um, for being such a welcoming community to Tree People. Uh, we've been working in the mountains here in the Santa Monicas for decades now. And we love being up here doing a lot of restoration work. You probably have seen many of, of us tree people out there pulling invasive, non-native uh, plants. We've been planting lots of trees. And so all of the suffering and the disaster when the fires, when Woolsey, the fires happened, and we felt it. That, that, that pain, that, that suffering, our board chair, his son lost his home. Um, Beth Burnham, who's one of our um, board members who's here, was evacuated. Even though I was in Topanga, we were evacuated. We had another board member um, who also lost um, uh, where she has her, her horses, her animals. Um, so it was something that just tested us as tree people to the core of what we do. Because we had to go back when we were finally able to come back and look at our sites to see how the sites had done. Because we have, for years, been talking about doing, um, you know, more, being more fire resilient in how we do our, our restoration work. So we were happy in some of the sites that we had done that we saw that the trees that we had planted actually survived. And they helped protect other, you know, other, other trees, smaller trees, we had planted other, other structures that were in the area. So we are completely committed to continuing to do everything we possibly can 
to be partners to the city of Malibu, who has been fantastic to work with, um, with all of you as, as homeowners in the area, with other of our nonprofit partners that are doing work, with land managers that are managing hundreds of thousands of acres in the area, to ensure that we are all better prepared. Because as we will see, and as we will hear from, from Craig, the experiences that we all have to learn from what has happened in other parts of the world, we have to be prepared for that. Because we don't want to be a community that, that like Paradise, has now the record for the, for the deadliest fire in California history. We don't want that. We don't want to be victims, and we don't want to be the ones that you know, aren't able to, to be resilient um, when fires happen. So thank you to all of you for being here. Um, we are planting in the area with volunteers, with our staff. We're doing restoration work. We are trying, we're, we're looking at more opportunities to actually encourage homeowners to have fire or, or uh, firefighting water on their properties with cisterns and tanks, redoing your landscapes so your landscapes are actually more fire resilient. So these are all programs that we're doing, working with environmental on our environmental education program, so they're working with schools. We have a lot of programs that we are doing throughout um, the county, but, but focused more and more um, in the Santa Monica's because the Santa Monica's are clearly um, communities that have the highest risk for fire. So, um, you know, be open-minded today, ask questions. We have a panel of experts. Um, this is not going to be the only um, session or workshop that we do. We intend to continue, as we have done in the past, continue to, to really focus in our efforts um, in restoring the Santa Monica's and ensuring that, that we do have the safest, um, healthiest, greenest, and also more, most fire-resilient communities that we can. So with that, I'd like to introduce Andy Lipkis, um, who's our founder. Many of you may know Andy. Um, Andy founded Tree People 46 years ago. So when I say that we have been working here for decades, we have been working here for almost 50 years. So Andy founded um, you know, Tree People and um, has really just, you know, I think, created one of the organizations that truly is most accessible to people and an organization that is there for you because this organization is based out of, you know, the ability for anybody, it doesn't matter. I heard somebody over here talking about, I'm going on vacation, can you take care of three of my plants? <laughs> because I don't know, I mean, and, and it's like, we, anybody could, could take care of trees or plants or whatever it is, like, that's what we do at Tree People. We empower everybody to know you, you can make a difference to make your communities um, safer. So with that, I'd like to introduce um, Andy. Best one. Ah, we got it. Wow. Thank you. Uh, my partner in grime when we're planting trees together. <laughs> uh, uh, it's really a pleasure and honor to be here with you. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, as Cindy said, we're doing this because we're, we're here for community. Uh, and we coined the term citizen forestry to actually notice early, early on that when our forests were dying almost 50 years ago, uh, and the Forest Service said they didn't have the resources to restore them, that it was, if anyone was going to save the forest, it was going to be us kids. Uh, we started finding ways to involve people, thousands, hundreds, thousands, and millions of people to actually get engaged, and that's what we do. Uh, and I'll get back to that in a second, but just I've got a, a bunch of little um, grounding us here uh, about first safety. So those are the doors to get out, and you can turn left, go down the hall, and get out of the building. And if you need to use the bathroom, go out and go to the left, and then the bathrooms are on this floor. Uh, go left, and then right down a hallway, and they'll be on the left. Um, and we won't be taking a formal break tonight. It's a long program. So if you need a break, feel free to just tiptoe out and find the bathroom or whatever you need. So I want to start by thanking our funders. This uh, whole series wouldn't have been possible without the help of people stepping up so we could bring this really special resource who you're going to meet 
in a few minutes, Craig Lapsley, all the way from Australia. Uh, so the Australian Consul General, uh, the consulate from Los Angeles, the Hilton Foundation, the Rockefeller 100 Resilient Cities um, program, the people, employees, and the company of Disney, uh, the people and the, empl the employees and the company of Boeing. And I mention those two because both have had people from the company volunteering for us for 46 years and giving out of their own pockets to ensure that we could be here. And the companies, both companies have followed their people. And, um, and it's very cool. Uh, the California Fire Safe Council has also uh, one of our main sponsors. We also want to thank our co-sponsors, LA County Supervisor Sheila Kuehl, uh, Ventura County Supervisor Linda Parks, the American Planning Association, the Las Virginis Municipal Water District, and especially, I'll say one of our partners, uh, the City of Malibu, uh, for hosting this evening. So the reason why we organized this event was to promote a new understanding that we are in a massive change. And the change is many of us have been hearing about the change coming for 40 years. And we keep on hearing, well, it's somewhere out there. But the climate has changed. And it has yielded all the infrastructure that we've built, that we have counted on to protect public health and safety, to protect our homes. That infrastructure can no longer do the job for the magnitude of and severity of weather, winds, droughts, fires. You've experienced it. You're victims of it. Um, and our expectations that we can always be rescued by someone else outside the community, by first responders, isn't any longer anything you can count on. This is not blame. This is not indictment. The, the magnitude of what we face is so big that if those of you who've read or heard about the writer Rebecca Solnit, she's just said straight out, in today's world, you are more likely to be rescued by your neighbor or you rescue your neighbor than anything else. And that's just because they can't be where we need them. Or we can't count that they'll be at our home when there's hundreds of thousands of homes in danger at the very same time. So um, we want to have us as a community uh, understand that there, we need to change policies, um, our own actions, codes, and actually change the game so we can get financial resources to help us do the adaptation we need to do in our homes and our communities. Tree People's here tonight to enable you to have new options, to bring new options on the table, uh, to give us hope, preparedness, perhaps fuel your advocacy, as well as your readiness to change. I've been talking to you. I know you're ready to change. That's a big thing. Our goal is to inspire you to take responsibility, to understand that you will make the difference by what you do at your home, what you do with your neighbors, the conversations that you have day in and day out. So why is it Tree People that's here? Simply, our mission is to inspire, engage, and support the people of greater Los Angeles to take personal responsibility for the environment and to participate in making this region safe, healthy, fun, sustainable, and resilient. And to share our lessons, our successes, and our failures with other cities, other people around the world. So notice there's no tree mentioned in that. but, but um, it is all about people, always has, and we don't separate the word tree and, the, and people because when we separate ourselves from trees and the environment, we get into trouble. So that mission aims us squarely in this field of climate resilience, preparedness for drought, for flood, for fires, for severe heat, all of these things that are affecting people across our community. Why we've brought Australia here as an example is they've been experiencing these threats, this severity, massive loss of life, whole communities burnt up for more than 10, 15 years. They've uh, had a chance to deal with 
some of the same climate conditions, some of the same challenges uh, that we're now facing. And they figured out a lot. Uh, tree people was watching what they were doing with water. Uh, the Boeing company paid for us to do a major research trip down to Australia to see how they saved the country in a 12 year long drought. And what we saw was that there was no time to build all new infrastructure. But when people in the community became the infrastructure and the government supported them in taking action, one, capturing the rain in tanks at home, like that. This happens to be in Los Angeles because we transferred it here. But 40% of the homes, 40% of the homes in Sydney and in Melbourne installed cisterns. People had immediately their own water supply because it never, you know, the rain did come and, you know, it comes here and we lose it. So uh, we brought delegations of uh, California legislators and policy people to go see it, to see what the people would do. One of the things is Australians are very much like us. And, um, uh, and so the lifestyles and the changes they made, we can easily do. So uh, two other pictures really quickly. Um, the work that we were doing that I just wanted you to see, um, we've been planting oaks and restoring native habitat around the Santa Monica Mountains for the last 15 years. And what happened during the Woolsey fire is for the most part, because we remove the non-native grass and cut it, go to the next slide, the fire came to the site and jumped over it. There was nothing to burn. The oaks um, are very hard to ignite. You see roasted oaks that turn brown. Most of those are still alive and re-sprouted. And that's part of what we're doing, and there's opportunities to join us in replanting as we get access to the lands. So um, getting rid of the slides. Uh, I wanted to cover some ground rules really quickly to help us all get through this together and make it productive. Um, so if you'll please silence your cell phones. Um, and then just realize we're here seeking common ground and understanding. We all know the problems. We know there's conflict. This is the time to actually come together. I invite you, if you're going to disagree, do it without being disagreeable. Um, ask what's possible, not what's wrong, and keep asking. We're here to talk. So is that OK with everyone? Can you buy into those simple ground rules? Does anybody not be able to live with this? <laughs> is that a yes or a no? <laughs> yeah. Tonight, <laughs> for the next couple of hours. Thank you. That is really great. So there's some issues we're not covering. As the mayor talked about, we're not talking about prescribed burns. Um, we're talking about preparation for fire resilience, not what to do the day of. If questions come up about the following topics, our esteemed facilitators will redirect us to keep us on track. It's just because there's so much ground to cover. Um, so yes, we're not talking about prescribed burns. Uh, utility regulations or policies of shutting down the power. It's a big one, but we're not taking that on tonight. Um, so that's it, actually. Um, my job now is to introduce uh, our facilitator tonight is Tracy uh, Kettleman. She's the executive director of the California Fire Safe Council. She recently um, joined the California Fire Safe Council staff uh, after serving on the board from 2004 to 2007. She's a prof registered professional forester with extensive background in community wildfire preparedness, conservation, restoration, and temperate forest management. She's been in the game a really long time. You'll be able to read more of her bio uh, in the materials that we have. But uh, she has facilitated planning in this community and across the state, helping achieve consensus and moving things ahead uh, when things got blocked. And I'm looking for my notes, my introduction for Craig. It disappeared. Well, Craig Lapsley. 
Um, it, I am so pleased to be able to introduce Craig and having brought him here. I met him in Australia um, just about a year ago, but heard about his work. So he was on the front lines during the fires. He's led major transformation in the analysis of what worked, what failed in those fires. Uh, and he'll be talking all about that. But uh, for a fire professional uh, to have gotten the religion of community connectedness and what that is about, about caring, taking care of each other and rescuing each other and planning well so we don't suffer so much. Uh, it's, he's Im imbided, embodied it, embedded it, and, um, and that's uh, my term for in integrity. Um, two things that really moved me, when I went to visit uh, their resilience center, their emergency command center for the entire state that he was head of operating. So this massive emergency command center uh, was uh, one entire floor of the state office building in Melbourne. He'll explain where that is. Um, many offices around the outside of various agencies on the outside of the room, uh, edges of the room. But they took me to one, it was a huge room with one table with nearly 100 seats at it. Name placards at every seat. Education. Tribal affairs, the arts, health. Those hundred seats. That group, that team meets every week, twice a week for a minimum of 30 minutes. Their job is to connect and keep the community connected in a two-way conversation all the time. And um, are you going to talk about the app or should I? No. You do it. I'm going to turn it over. Um, so anyhow, um, our centerpiece, rich in knowledge, and thank you for coming all the way over to support and uh, spread the word. Craig Lapsley. Uh, good evening. And um, I'll, be, I'll be rather quick, because we do need to get to um, what this tonight is all about, which is about yourselves. It's fantastic to be here, and I, I thank Andy and the team. Uh, but yesterday I had the pleasure to be at a policy officers forum, which was from three counties, um, utilities, uh, state um, of California representatives, and uh, we presented and we talked in detail about uh, lots of policy issues. And I've got to say, and it's an absolute pleasure to, to repeat this to you, the, the commitment in the room to have partnerships with the communities that have been impacted by these fires was overwhelming to me. I just felt it. And sometimes it's very easy to see government officials, um, local government officials, where it's all about them. And I'm not being rude, you know. It, it, sometimes it's the bureaucratic stuff that gets driven. But I walked away and it was very clear that they, and one in particular talked about how important this partnership was with the community post-fire and the learnings they're having and the changes it will bring. And, and I, I had no doubt um, that the changes will be long-term changes. Now, that's up to them to do that. Um, but it also had mayors and deputies mayors and so on to do. Um, and Craig's up the front here with me tonight. And the good thing about Craig and Craig is that we've got the same sort of shirts on, but the difference is we've got different hairstyles. So just, you'll pick that out. <laughs> That's, so, so I'll take you through a couple of slides um, and I will do them rather quick and, and um, just for time so we get to the workshop bits. Um, we had an event in 2009 called the Victorian 2009 Black Saturday Fire. So obviously it occurred on a Saturday. Now, on this Saturday in February, um, school children were back at school from their, 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 vac their holidays, but obviously being a Saturday, they weren't at school. That was a good thing. Because we lost three schools. Uh, we lost, and I'll show you in a moment, over 2,000 homes. We lost 173 lives. Um, we think that we would have seen uh, the schools, if the kids had been there, we would have lost three schools and the population of those young primary schools would have been lost. I didn't explain that yesterday, but if, you've, if you think about it, and just close your eyes and think about the loss of children and large numbers of children, that is devastating. Absolutely devastating. Now, we lost lives, uh, but in the main, they were, they were adult-aged um, people. So it had, it's got huge impacts. Victoria, this is quick. Victoria is the most southern part of Australia, and I'll show where it fits into Australia in a moment. 
Uh, Victoria is the most, one of the most fire prone areas in the world. Uh, it sits in the southern part of Australia and the winds travel across Australia from the north to the south. So they come across the land and come as hot winds, dry winds, um, they come with speed and we have extreme temperatures. And a bad day, a bad fire day, will see the winds change in direction. Now, I think I, I'm explaining a little bit about California. That's why we're so much alike. And for my eight years as a commissioner, I made um, very good friends in California um, to make sure that we were learning together. So I've spent a fair bit of time in California from, um, from resilience with municipalities and also fire departments. And we've seen after the wind change, we lose more property and um, we've traditionally had more death as a result. Death in Australia in fires is quite significant. So 825 deaths um, over 110 years, two thirds of those have been in the state of Victoria and um, the highest death rate was the, the fires that we're talking about today and reflecting on the lessons because they've had the biggest impact. And also, um, it's about understanding where you are. So it's a fact, 50% of those lives have been um, lost close to bushfire, or bush areas or forested areas. And that tells you about fire intensity. And I'll talk about intensity of fire in a moment, which is one of the most fundamental parts. Um, that's Australia. And the, the, the area that's marked in the red there is Victoria. So that's the weather pattern for February 2009, now 10 years ago, where we had 10 plus years of drought um, we didn't have a lot of water. We had very little water. Um, we had one of the hottest days, so um, 40, 48 degrees, 118 degrees Fahrenheit. I've got to get these conversions right. Um, we saw humidity basically a dry, a very, very dry day. And this was at three o'clock in the morning. It started and went to mid-afternoon, it was 48 or 118 degrees, and wind speeds that were um, excessive wind speeds. So the fires themselves were unpredictable, erratic, uncontrollable. Um, when I say all consuming, they consumed everything. If you're in their way, they consumed you. The death rates of 173, um, it was one of those things that either you were either there or you weren't. And if you were there, it, it consumed everything. Um, but we also saw townships burn from the bottom points about ember attack. Um, where there was gas cylinders that vented and lit up fences or other properties, so house to house burning. And that was very hard to understand because we hadn't really experienced a lot of that before. We'd, we'd experienced where fires had come, come into town, travel through the town, but this one was embers 25 kilometres ahead, so I don't know, work that out in miles, a long way. Um, but they weren't just uh, leaf type embers, they were, because of the weather conditions, they were bark or um, twigs or branches from trees, so they were big debris. And we also saw that the houses were compromised because of building construction. So roofs were being lifted off houses and fire were entering the house through the roof being lifted off. Now some of this, I don't know whether this is your story, it could be. I'd say it would be. So these things started to challenge our systems of work. So as a result of those fires, um, they're the figures there, and I won't go through them, you can read them, but it's devastating in the broad scale of what it is. Um, but when you go through a challenge systems, it challenged the fire authorities, it challenged the building design, it challenged the way in which we wish to live in the bush, adjacent to the bush. It challenged the way in which we operated as people. It challenged information systems. And you think, when you have, um, and you've experienced, when you have death in your community, it's, it's, it's very deep. It's very deep. When you have multiple deaths in communities, it's even deeper. And we've got 10 years on that some people are still grieving and struggling to even rebuild. We've got some people that have not rebuilt 10 years on. And we've got some people that cannot go back to the community that they lived in 10 years ago and have not returned in the 10 years. So this is deep in a community sense, which when I get to the, the key part of my message is tell you why the community is so important. So all of those things there, big impacts, huge impacts. Government has a Royal Commission. The Royal Commission comes up with a report after 100 days of sitting of major changes. I won't go through them tonight, and we did with the policy officers, but major changes. And my job was put in as the Commissioner, a brand new position to lead the change. And change was every day. 
And if anyone's led any change, you can be loved by some, um, you can also be hated by many because some people do not like change. It's not an easy job to, to lead change, but this had that much community momentum that change was wanted and needed. So the consequences were um, what I call the Ds. Death and injury, destruction, displacement and dispersal of community. Now you think about those things. So all of a sudden when you have destruction, everything's gone. You have people displaced and dispersed where they don't normally live. They get disconnected from their community. Where the kids normally went to school, they didn't go to school. Where people travelled every day, they didn't. All of those things, huge community impacts, huge. And then it goes on about victims and survivors. And we were very quick to move the model from being a victim to be a survivor. And one of the ways to get people back in the game is exactly what's happening here. To be a survivor means you need to be in the game. You need to get and talk about those things of how you're going to do fencing, access, re rebuilding, the things that matter to you. And the survivor mentality is so important in a psychology sense. So how we do that, we can do that together. But I guarantee that anyone's had major loss, I'll still wake up at four o'clock in the morning and think, what happened to me? 12 months later, two years later, three years later, it will be there. And we're all different. And the bit in this slide that, and I won't go through it all, but on, on the side that's got children, youth, men and women, individuals, family, neighbourhoods and communities is really important. We are different. If children are, uh, are, uh, have got grief, they will, they will treat it different than someone that's in youth in their ages of 13, 14, 15, 16. And that needs to be acknowledged at community level about how children and youth will behave different from something they've lost or the trauma of these events. School education is really important about counselling. Family counselling, the ability to talk it through. What will be the thing that brings back the event? Is it the t next time they smell smoke or is it the next windy day? Or is it the next hot windy day? Is it the next hot windy day that's got smoke in the sky? And it will do. You will all, you will all have some reaction at some stage about the next day that these things replicate. Absolutely will. And, and it might be delayed. Men and women behave differently. Uh, we've done research that talks about the males will get very busy and the women will stop and think and be the strategic leader in the family unit. And when I say the family unit, that can be a large family unit, not, not mum and dad and two children at home, the family unit, that broader family unit. And then it talks about what individuals will do, let alone families, and neighbourhoods become really important. Our research showed that in the recovery phase, people that engage into these types of meetings will be better off long term. Those that go back and get busy doing their own thing on their own property and forget to connect or can't find the time to connect will later on struggle to recover. It will take longer. So I suppose there's a message in here, those that aren't here, where are they? And they've all got good reasons why they're not here, but there might be that friendly hand that needs to be put out about the neighbourhood to say, you need to be part of this. Because we've certainly done the research and learned a lot about the behaviours of people and we've spent more time in that probably, we've done a lot in infrastructure, but the people bit, the community bit was so, so important. So, so important. And it goes on about your economic stability and how you connect back to employment. All of those, all of those things about your mental health, uh, what it does impacting on your, on your medical health, your physical health, and we're all getting older. But we've, we've got to, it's got to be an honesty trip about what these events do to us because they have a huge impact. Now from that, um, the, there's, a, there's a couple of things about information and decision making. Good information allows people to be empowered, engaged, and that moves to the survivor. I looked at, um, when I come in, uh, people might have watched what I, when I come in, I was looking at the front desk of this office and I picked up every one of the pieces of information that was there from planning issues, temporary fences, but I read one in, that's headed here, um, hope and healing. And it's all the things that I just talked about. And it's put in one page. And if you only pick up that and think, okay, what's it mean to be my partner, my neighbour, my friend, the friend that I don't know that becomes a friend, these are the things that do matter. So I'd suggest the information that's out here to Craig, to the Mayor, to the city and to the partners of the city, well done, because I, I, I can see that the structures are here to allow people to truly be connected and be valued. 
Now, it mightn't be, it mightn't be everything, but I think it sounds to be that you've certainly got the 90 percentile well and truly done from my observation just walking in. Um, and it is about decision making and it is about a community. And those words up there are really important. Better information, better decisions. If you make better decisions, you'll end up with, a, with better outcomes and you'll end up with a safer community and you'll end up with a community. So th those words there are not just spin words, they're really important understandings, but they're simple enough to say, hey, if I've got the information, I can do something with it. I can think it through. The other one, and this is, this is an, and I'm not going to go through this, but we spent a lot of time about building. So we talked about the building materials and construction. We've talked about managing vegetation. Uh, we've gone into new standards. We've got new guidelines. We've changed things dramatically. How do you create defendable space and maintain it? How do you build your landscape around your property that assists you to do it? And how do you manage your property? Now, I will give one little story, and I'll probably look at people over time. We actually had a township in 2000 in Berlin, a coastal township burned down. 180, 168 um, houses burnt down. There was no one in there. We didn't lose life. We didn't have injury. It's a coastal town. Normally about 100 people live there. Christmas time, our summer period, 4,500 people will be there every, every day. Um, eight of those houses over the 168 were built to the new standards and four of them burnt to the ground. And everyone went, the, f the standards have failed. We went back and looked at them. One, um, as the person left, they unfortunately left the back door open and the fire entered through the back door. All the work they'd done around the building, the simple thing of not closing the door was the was the, that, that broke the system of success. That was very hard for them to understand because they'd invested with double glazing and different building materials and all the rest. Everything that's in that table you can't see. The three others were about housekeeping. Trampolines underneath the property. Um, stuff stacked against the side of the building. So it actually had a fire that was directly impacting and in the end it burnt the property down. Now, we've, our standards are about taking the fire for about 30 or 40 minutes and passing through. They're not built to be fortresses that will take fire for hours and hours and hours. And the fourth one that burnt down was about a retaining wall that came right up to the property that burnt and the retaining wall lit the building up. Now, that was hard to take. So it took us those lessons about the housekeeping and the materials and the landscape around it to take it another step. And we've done some of the work on that. So those sorts of things are important and I know you're in that space about what it is and I've looked at your program about architects coming to help you um, design and understand and building materials. And these do come at a cost, but I suppose what's the cost? If it, if it, if it ends up being the ultimate outcome, the, the cost may not be as significant as what, you, what people may think. The, if I can get this to work, next thing, water supplies. So we've, we've mandated that water tanks have to be on property, tanks have to be um, able to withstand fire, they can't have connections that melt, they've got to be visible for firefighters. But if you are there, um, it's also going to be usable by the owner, owner or occupier of the building. Now, you've got evacuation. We don't evacuate to the same level. We have a different warning system about how people move in and out of communities. And if people have got a pecuniary interest, they can stay on the property. So we've got a different set of rules around our communities of, of what happens. But what, what I think we'll talk tonight about in the panels is water and water storage. That's the simplest thing. There are more complexity about water, um, but it is about capturing water off the building that's stored on property to make sure that there is water on property for firefighting. And um, I, I don't know to the extent of that, but I think we'll get into that maybe in the panel tonight. Now, the last bit I want to talk about quickly, community connection. Um, I think you've got the flavour. I'm very strong about community, extremely strong. How do you get a connected community? How do you get the passion, the compassion that you've got, the passion that you've got, the care factor that you've got to be connected in a community, not just for bushfire, but for the resilience of the total community? And it's all about those principles and they're common sense things, respect, integrity, inclusion, um, sharing information, being communicators, um, being carriers, getting balanced outcomes, but also knowing what you want as a community. And how do you then engage with the, 
the council or the agencies about what you want? How do you have that discussion with the utilities or the fire departments or the council about what you think is important? It's really powerful. We're seeing some great movement there, but we're also suggesting that there's, there's got to be smarter ways to do it. We're looking at technologies about how we plan better. Um, I'm not sure everyone's got the time on every Thursday night to come to the City Hall and have a meeting about a plan. How do we do that in a, in a way that's shared through social media? How do we develop these tools that are interactive and meaningful for communities? We've got the principles about it. We've got some great outcomes. We've got some great community plans, but have we got it right? And no, we haven't. And the other thing, not every one community is the same. They've got different needs, they've got different capabilities, but it's so important and it's empowering. The second thing then is what I talk about, the trusted networks and the trusted leaders. You will have in your communities already, and I don't know your communities, although I had the pleasure to drive through this area on Saturday to have a look at the fires, um, but you've got sporting groups, you've got school groups, you've got the trusted networks in your community that are already there and operate all the time and you are part of them. You've also got trusted leaders and some of the trusted leaders just won't be those of the, the president of the, of the football club or the hockey club or the, or the arts group. They will be people that are iconic in the community. And they may not be elected officials. They may simply be individuals that are good at caring about others and leading and being trusted. And we're working very hard to engage with them. And quite often, these groups, the trusted networks, and the trusted leaders are left out until late. And then, oh, we better go and see them. We're saying they've got to be in what I call the before, during and after. They've got to be in the planning for it. They've got to be in the event. And they've certainly got to be in the aftermath, the after bit. And, and hopefully we'll talk a little bit more about that. You may have this solution. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know your community. But we have spent so much time about the value and respect of community that's never been done to that extent before. And to do that, there is a model about well-being, livability, sustainable and viable communities. That's a connected community. Uh, and I will I'll just talk quickly about the well-being, which is you will champion this. And if, you, and if you're not championing it, take the time to champion it. It's where I started. Caring for others. Caring about the mental health of others. Caring about the connection of others. Um, but being um, that caring person and caring community. The livability thing is... I'm sure, from what I've seen, people are living in um, substandard conditions. People are not able to get back onto their properties. People are disconnected. So the livability issue about being part of those things is alive and well right now. Just those two alone, if you think about that in your neighbourhood, your family, your community, I'm sure there's things you'll take away from this discussion tonight of how to do the well-being and the livability better. Sustainability is about microeconomics and viability is about macroeconomics. And I won't go there, but it's a really good model that we've developed. It's, it's, it's not a new model at all. It's a, it's, a, it's a model that we can put together. And you know what? Most people connect to it really quick and go, I can fit in there as a person, as a family, or as my neighbourhood. Now, I'm going to leave it there. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Tracy, who's going to champion us through the evening. That was amazing. Thank you. So inspiring. And I, I'm a community organizer at heart, so I love that. We want to hear from you. You have some questions for Craig. He is going to be on both of the next panels. And just to give you a little context, the first panel is going to be talking more specifically about what to do about your homes and around them, and the second panel more about the community aspect of it. But please, sir. Uh, you said something about pecuni pecuniary interest in staying or not staying on the property. That wasn't clear to me what you said, and could you explain it first? Um, yeah. Uh, so our legislation still says that if you own a property, you have a, a financial investment in it, you've got the right to stay to protect it. So when we evacuate, um, we will only evacuate in the term of evacuation when there is a fire in the area and it's deemed that that, that area is under threat. Before that, we put really solid messaging out for the day before, the morning of it about people leaving early, but their responsibility is to leave, and their responsibility is to pack the alpaca in the back of the car or the rabbit in the 
in the boot and put the family in as well and take the valuables, the belongings and do those things. And it's all part of a very solid plan, but we don't evacuate to the same level as what happens in California due to that legislation. It's a fundamental difference between what we do and what happens here. Yep, and it's all about your personal right to stay with what you own. So it's a fundamental difference. If you have more questions about evacuation, I encourage you to talk to Craig afterwards out in the hallway. And if you have a question, please stand up and state it. Yeah, we've got a number of systems, but probably the building system. Oh, it's, no, sorry, the system, the water system. If we go back, so, so in that water there, we've talked about where we've now in the guidelines mandated that there needs to be 10,000 litres of water, which is 4,000 US gallons, I'll get it right, that has to be stored on property for firefighting. If that's in a tank that you've got domestic water and firefighting water in one tank, the domestic water can only be taken off to where the, the 4,000 gallons is, is there. It's got to be dedicated for firefighting. From that, it then needs to be connected through um, solid piping. It can't be PVC piping, it can't be plastic piping, it has to be solid piping so it doesn't melt or it can't be impacted by fire. So we had a number in 2009 that had all of the things I just talked about. The fire would come, the tank would be impacted um, and it would burn, the plastic tank would burn where there's no water in it. So as you were lowering down, the tank would compromise, the piping would break and in the end the system would break. So um, it has to be available for firefighting so for firefighters to use as well as the property owner. And it can be connected to sprinklers on the property. It can be connected, so we, we, we have got designs of sprinklers that help keep the area wet. And one of the things about when people leave the property, they may be turning on their sprinklers to keep the area damp. So when the fire comes, it's got a lesser ability to ignite coming up. So the defendable space is actually moist. And I won't, I won't say it's wet because it's a sprinkler system. Um, so it won't be soaked, but it will be moist. So we're, we're trying to give the defendable space of where you've cleared a better chance with then using water on it by water that's stored on property. And most of that water is collected from the roof or could be supplemented. So that's basically it. Um, I suppose the other bit is um, we have seen people uh, build tanks into their structure of their buildings. So underneath the building, the tank, the tank will be. Um, uh, or they may um, have the tank put in a place that it gets better gravity feed. So position it up so it runs off the roof, but the tank is still able to give better head pressure for a gravity feed system. So it's a design issue that plumbers and others would do. Uh, so what I've described is a little bit more detailed than that, but hopefully I've given you the, the frame, I suppose, of what we're trying to do with storage of water on site. We have a little delay. Um, we're going to speak about this in more detail on the next panel. I did want to mention that in California law, if you're not on a public system, it's 2,500 gallons that you have to have. And if you are going to be using a tank for agriculture or whatever, you can pipe in two different lines. So one will go out to your ag, and the other one is at, to maintain that 2,500 gallons. So it's like what he was saying for the 4,000. Did you still have a question here? Um, will we have access to the slides? Yeah. They'll be yeah. posted somewhere? Yeah. Three people. Three people. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Good question. <laughs> I'm going to leave this on. The bios and the slides will be available on the Tree People website. So. The, we experienced a lot of power failure. Um, I, are those systems going to work without a generator? Um, very good. So power for us is one of the key parts. So we then talk about petrol powered pumps. So some people will elect to have a petrol powered pump. Um, that is, so a, a pump that does not rely on electricity. And where there is electric pumps, we do then talk about generators. So there is backup power on the property. The, the overall question that I've raised before is, I understand each homeowner should do whatever they can to, to prevent fire from impacting their property. But it would seem more efficient since 80% of the water, the rain, the precipitation we get ends up in the Pacific Ocean, mm. that 
the governments combined, be it the county or the state, would create in the mountains a huge area with, with huge tanks where that whole area, just as you described on your property, would, if not drench it, at least make it more difficult to have an irrigation system. It's going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars, but the cost of what's happening is, is horrific. And, and why not have a fire break up there? Thank you so much. And so now if our other three panelists could come on up, Jay, Cassie, and David. And while they're coming up, I just want to say I'm really excited to be back here. I had the honor of working here in the Santa Monica Mountains on your Community Wildfire Protection Plan back in 2009, 2010. And um, we led about a dozen meetings then. And it's so interesting to see how the conversation is evolving and how we're all evolving with this. So um, I am going to very briefly tell you who is on our panel, and then you're going to hear from each of them for about a minute. And then we'll have a few questions up here and then have some time for all of you to have questions. And so you've met Craig from Australia. Um, next to Craig is David Hertz, the founder and president of SCA Studio Environmental Architecture, the Resilience Lab, and SkySource. And we've got your local Craig George, the Director of Environmental Sustainability Department for the City of Malibu. Cassie Ayagi, from the President of Forum LA Landscaping, and Jay Lopez from LA County Fire. And with that, um, why don't we start with you, or do we have, I guess we'll start with David. <laughs> and you've got a minute. Got it? Okay, hi. Sorry for your loss. Uh, my grandfather came to Malibu in the 40s. We, um, he built Paramount Ranch along with my father, which was tragically lost in the fire. We are both in Paradise Cove, right at the edge of the fire, and um, up in western Malibu, above Deer Creek. So we, um, we used some preventative strategies that were helpful. Community was absolutely essential during the Woolsey Fire. Um, I've been very interested in the concept of resilience after 35 years of architecture practice around sustainability. As um, Andy said earlier, you know, we, we saw uh, sustainability, we met, moved to restoration, and now the things that we talked about are upon us, and resilience is certainly the operative word. Um, we've been very interested in testing uh, resources. Water, of course, is key for fire, but maximization of water through other technologies, especially like biodegradable foam systems, can advance um, water use by a factor of at least 10, so that you know if you are leaving the property with sprinklers, you can advance how long that water will use uh, and, and is used and will stay. Um, we're working with fire retardant soils, developing zones that are both um, with a phoscheck like phosphate, so that that's much more of a seasonal. So after brush clearance, we're leaving that for the entire season until it rains, and then you get heavy fertilization. Falling back to foam systems before you leave, um, and and then fire retardant. Um, a lot of the surfaces that we're working with we're applying fire retardants to those surfaces, um, especially even in the framing stage, because as we tragically know, so many of our buildings burn by ember over time. And if, that, if the building before it was wrapped was treated with fire retardant, that could be a very effective measure as well. So I'll pass that on. Thank you, David. Craig. Uh, good evening, and first I'd like to thank everybody for showing up here tonight. I, I really appreciate that, and like Mayor Wagner said, uh, my name is Craig George. I'm the Environmental Sustainability Director for the City of Malibu, but I'm also the building official, and that's kind of the role I'll be participating in more tonight about building codes and how codes can address resiliency and sustainability. Uh, the LA County Building Code was adopted by the City of Malibu and Chapter 7A has a lot of minimum standards and that's what I want to point out with building codes. These are minimum standards. You can certainly go beyond. There's a lot of opportunity uh, to do that <clears throat> if you're protecting your house, rebuilding your house, thinking of designing a house and building in the future. 
a lot of the things that you can think about are available. Uh, there's a marketplace for a lot of these products, like David had mentioned. Uh, we do look at those, but again, the codes are a minimum standard, and those are just the things you have to meet. There are th other things that you can do. And so tonight I'm hoping we can discuss about the process of submitting in and looking at different alternatives of different products that, that can be considered to increase the resistivity of the, the dwellings and other structures in the city. Um, I'm just curious out of curiosity here, the, the, tonight this, this meeting is being held in the city of Malibu and I'm curious how many folks live in the city of Malibu that are here this evening, just a show of hands. Okay, and with that, how many people suffered losses from the Woolsey fire? Because I know in the city of Malibu so that's, that I'm, I'm glad, I mean, I'm not glad for your loss, but I'm glad you're here to learn about some of this tonight. Um, one of the goals of the city is we've really worked hard, and I thank Craig for pointing that out. We have a lot of handouts, we have a lot of things that we've looked. We didn't create this stuff because there's unfortunately a lot of experience in California with fires, and we look to other, Santa Rosa, to Ventura for the Thomas fire, to see, learn lessons learned that are good lessons that we can provide to the community. So there is, a lot of things that we've learned, uh, a lot of things we feel we know what to do right because of that, unfortunately, having to have experienced that. But one of the main things with the city, if you're in the rebuilding consideration process, we want to help you, we want to get you on the right track. So we encourage anybody to come to City Hall uh, Monday through Friday. We have staff here that can assist you in building and what you need to do to get that process started. We also have staff that can assist you in looking at resilient type of products and ways to go about doing that. And we just encourage anybody that has any kind of questions, whether you're rebuilding from a fire loss, any kind of thing like that, to come to City Hall, look on our website. We have a lot of information on there and learn what you need to learn, but do ask the questions. I think the most important thing in any of this is asking the questions because everybody has a unique circumstance. In Malibu and much of the hills in Santa Monica, there's not tracts of home that all look alike and you can repeatedly do the same thing over and over again. Everybody, every house is individual and it has to have specific considerations for protecting that house. So we're here to help with that. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to come into City Hall, ask those questions and we'll move on. Thank, Thank you, Craig. Cassie. Um, I'm here to impart as much information about FireWise landscaping choices as I possibly can tonight. So I'm going to give a few cues now so that uh, when the panel starts we can ask more questions. But uh, for one, one of the biggest things is defensible space. If you can imagine a firefighter standing within the first five to 10 feet around your house trying to find a safe place to be so that they can actually protect your home, your property, your family, keeping this space clear and clean, not just July, August, September, and October, but year round because we know fire season is an ongoing challenge um, and that was alluded to in Craig's talk with maintenance. Um, another point, if there's one thing that you can possibly do, it's identify and eradicate invasive plant species. And I could go on for days talking about this and what we can do and uh, alternatively, but one of the one adaptations that invasive species don't have is that they don't, uh, they are not adapted to our very hot summers and they dry out and essentially die and become fine fuels that feed a fire and move it fast. Um, the last thing is that smart landscaping choices protect us the most and make us healthier. And feeding back into the community, these smart la landscaping choices actually make our communities better, cooler, uh, help us save water, bring nature back, and also protect us from fire. Thank you, Cassie. And finally, Jay. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, sorry for your loss, but uh, like Greg said, we're here to help you. I'm one more person in the team to assist you with um, your rebuild. But also for those of you who is time, or you consider it's a good time to improve your homes or uh, retrofit your homes and do any work with that, we'll we'll here for you to do that work. So it's it's a like the home uh, is a comprehensive approach to all of this. It's not only home by home, but it's, it's community community because you, 
your fire protection is as good as your neighbor's fire protection. Uh, we saw in some of those examples that the how good is your neighbor, how good you are to your neighbor uh, as you protect your home or make your home safer, but all not in the vegetation around your home is what you have control of. So you can be a good uh, a steward of the community and bring that aspect to, uh, I'm making my home safer, let's all work together and, and develop that. And that aspect of community is the great part that Malibu has. I always admire how close together you are and how well you guys work together. And I think this is an opportunity uh, to work together, not only with the city, with the county, and all of us here in the front and yourself, and your neighbor. Um, so fire state councils that exist in Malibu are very successful. Um, community groups that are working together that we, are, we had come and speak with you guys are very successful. So i just here to encourage you to keep the work and working on defensible space from the house all the way to the area that you have control of around your home. Thank you, Jay. So we want to talk about what you can do as individual homeowners, landowners on your property to build that resiliency at home and to be, um, I don't want to say better prepared for the next fire, but to give you a, a good chance to survive the fire both individually and as a community. And I think one of the things, and you probably all know this a lot on a more deeper cellular level than I do living through the recent fires is that fire behavior is really changing and the way we look at wildfire and how we're experiencing fire is really different here in California. And um, that's why Craig's here tonight is because it's something that they have been dealing with in Australia. And what we've seen from the last few big fires here, the Woolsey fire, the Camp fire up in Butte County, and the Wine Country fires in uh, Sonoma and Napa County the last couple years, is that it's wind-driven embers and it's the house that really matters the most. I mean, you've seen so many pictures of houses, structures gone, and green trees around them. I think the classic one is the Kmart in Santa Rosa burnt down in a big concrete parking lot. And so why is that happening? And so we want to start there with the house and what it is we're learning, because I think we're learning really quickly now over the last two years about that. And so I just wanted to start with Jay to talk a little bit about the fire behavior that we saw in the Woolsey fire and what that meant at the home level and how homes were burning. Uh, well, just a, a little background. So in the last uh, 10 years, we have had the most uh, deadly fire um, and in the last couple of years. And we had the largest fire just seven months, and with the Thomas fire, seven months before the next fire, the Mendocino complex took over and it became the largest fire. Also, in the last three years in, in California, in Southern California especially, we had had a significant fire every day, every at least one day or at least one uh, every month of the year for the last three years. So when we talk about fire season or not fire season, for us fire season is all year round. So there's something to, to have in there. And what we see now is, is the fire behavior, how the fire behavior, some stuff that, uh, uh, some ways that the vegetation will burn in September, we see that in May sometimes. Um, and we, with the Colby fire in 2014, in January 16, 2014, we had fire behavior that we usually see sometime in June at, at that time. So drought, uh, climate change, uh, different factors are creating that. The big challenge for us is when that fire introduces into the community. Uh, the f fire behavior models that we have are difficult to maintain when the veg what is burning is not the same. So when we have chaparral or you have trees and all that, you, you can try, it. we have algorithms, we have math that help us get to an idea how that's going to burn when it goes to homes and it, what you're having in the homes and we have around the homes, all that's changing. And now we have ember cast not only from the vegetation around the community, but from house to house. So you go from having vegetative uh, ember cast into your house to now having a tar from a rooftop into the house. Uh, while we keep in the garage, we keep everything 
that you can think of we keep in our garages. Um, and also just start going into the ornamental plants right immediately to the house, palm trees. Um, I know it's Malibu, we love our palm trees, um, but they generate quite a bit of embers, large embers. During the Colby fire, we had a palm tree they cut up in Azusa, northern part of Azusa, landed in one of our fire stations, still in fire, four miles away from the fire, and the guys took some photos, because they couldn't believe that the fire was so far away, and a burning ember, large ember, from a palm tree landed in there. So plant selection is very important, but from the fire behavior point of view, it's not only what is happening in there, but once the fire is introduced to the community, things change completely and it becomes quite difficult. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Craig George, could you tell us a little bit more? You, you gave us a brief introduction about what you're doing here in the city of Malibu, but what people can do specifically in their homes to create those hardened homes that are more resilient? Well, I think there's two things. One is to rebuild a house, there's, you're gonna meet minimum code standards and there is fire resistivity standards in there that as I mentioned before, you can't exceed. But then there's a lot of homes. I mean, we lost in Malibu alone 465 residential structures, uh, which is mind blowing to me. After the 93 fire, we lost about 250 homes. So that's just how much more significant this fire was. But along with that, there's a lot of houses that did survive. And are there going to be wildfires in the future? Absolutely. We know that will happen. It's just the, the nature of things that has always happened. Can you do things now to protect your house or to build the resiliency? Absolutely. Um, there's a number of things you can look at, uh, whether it's the roof covering, making it a minimum standard. New construction has to have a class A minimum roof which is really a classification for how long it'll be resistive to a fire before it, it could ignite. Uh, windows, du double pane windows and tempered glass in one of those panes or both of those panes uh, protects embers from entering into the house. Having siding, there's a lot of, the, unfortunately there was a lot of houses in the Woolsey fire that had wood siding. And that back at the time in the 60s and 80s and in between, that was a popular building material. But I, unfortunately, or fortunately now that's prohibited, but there are a lot of materials, if you like that look, that are fire-resistant materials that look exactly like wood products. And so those are things you can consider if you have a house now and you want to protect it, looking at the roof covering, looking at the windows, looking at the siding, looking at the entrance points to the house, like with vents, attic vents, attic e vents, uh, how you can protect those. Those can be retrofitted if you do have them. So there's a lot of things you can look at. Uh, if you're interested, again, as I mentioned before, come to City Hall, have a discussion. What are, what are the things that you can do? I mean, we're, we're talking about the landscaping, which is very, very important, and the water, the amount of water and availability. So yes, you can put cisterns on your property. Uh, they mentioned I've seen houses in Malibu where the whole basement area is turned into a cistern. Uh, so there's issues you can look at with that for having the water, but I think the number one thing is to protect the structure itself, and that's using fire-resistive materials and code minimum materials that would address that. Thank you. And um, I am speaking so, to some architects recently who are talking about let's design homes without gutters and without vents and that architects can do that. And so we need to be changing our thinking in terms of how we build our homes, how we design our homes so that they really are much more resistant. Craig Lapsley here in Sacramento, we've been talking recently about changing the defensible space regulations so there will be a new zero to five foot non-combustible zone. That means nothing that is at all burnable, flammable, can be within the first five feet of your house. That means we have to, again, change the way we think about our homes and move all the vegetation that we usually have right around the house out five feet. So it's not right under your windows because what we've seen in a lot of these fires is an ember will land on a, a plant right under a window and generate enough heat to crack it. And it's one of those situations where you could have everything else is perfect with your house, but it's that one little thing. Dog doors and garage doors are another one to be really um, aware of. So how are you guys addressing this in Australia? Um, well, very similar actually, in the sense that um, building materials, building design, architects that are looking at are new ways, but ways that fit your lifestyle. And I think that's that chat you've got to have with the architects. You know, how do you want to use this building and how do you get the architectural 
design the building materials fitting into what you want in the livability of the place. Um, but you're right, Tracy. then it's the outside. And, and the defendable space doesn't mean that we have to have concrete backyards. It, it talks about removing the fuels that are the fine fuels. Five, you know, we've, we've got it 10 metres out, which is 30 feet. I'll get it right. But anyway, a space out. But we, we often see then that we design something. So on your day one that you move into your house, um, it's all there. 365 days down the year, you've put something in there that is the, the outdoor setting or you've, you've, you've stacked um, the wood for the, the barbecue or you've done things that you've introduced. And we're seeing that that is um, the, the compromising factor for what is the defendable space. So we design something, but then we don't use it or maintain it that way. And I think that's, that's a key issue about, that's only you can do that. It's your place, you live there, it's how you use it on these critical periods that are the fire, you know, the more fire prone areas. And I suppose, as you're saying, we're now seeing the same as California, that the traditional fire season is no longer the traditional fire season. We're seeing fires of significance that are very intense out of the normal season. So it's something that you just need to be attuned to or have the ability to easily move these things. You know, you won't do it if it's, if it's over-onerous to do so, but if it's something that, and I know, you know, an example of, a, of, a, of a, a door mat that could be the place where the embers land and that's the bit that starts burning, we, we say to people, pick up your door mat and throw it out. You know, throw it five metres away and then go and pick it back and bring it back in or design it out of your property, you know, design a floor, a, a, a doormat to not be part of the way you operate. Now, easy for me to say, but they're all um, critical pieces and the smallest issue could be the, the compromising factor. So we've got this great design and then we don't do some of the basic things. So we're seeing defendable space being compromised by the livability or, or the personal bits about how people live and behave in their own property. Thank you. Yeah, I th what, and again, the conversation that I've been part of, are it's really a paradigm shift in how we're living in California. And we're all used to earthquakes, right? You don't put big, heavy books up on a shelf somewhere where they could fall on us. It's the same thinking that we have to start getting into where we're not even thinking about that. It's just you just don't do it. You just know that you don't put a broom outside your house. Um, and I talked about that in those meetings here. In the 2003 Cedar Fire, house was lost because somebody left a broom next to the house. And that just created those fine fuels that, that started and caught the handle and there went the house. So it's really changing our mindset, changing our thinking, how we look and live on our properties. And we're at the cutting edge of that. It's moving fast, probably faster than usually we're used to as a cultural change, but here we are. Um, so I think that also ties in with water and we've come out long drought we have to look at how we live differently with water. And so, David, tell us about how we might do that here. Yeah, water is obviously critical. <clears throat> We're entering a, a different age where the past is no longer prologue with predictable weather. Um, you can see that, obviously, in this wet winter, but six to eight years prior to that, not having a lot of water. So, you know, we are looking at everything that we can do to capture stormwater. As the gentleman said earlier, we, we lost trillions of gallons in February just going back into the ocean. We need to do more um, in capturing water and our buildings can, can do that. A lot of what Australia has is from 10 years of drought and they've led the way in terms of water cistern and water collection. So capturing stormwater collection, having that stormwater collection in, in a um, defensible storage position, ideally gravity fed so that one is not completely dependent upon pumps. Having emergency backup, backup for wells is absolutely critical if you're on wells um, and, and generated power. Um, not having plastic tanks or plastic fittings, and then maximizing the use of water that you do have. You know, unfortunately, many of the homes that were involved in <clears throat> helping clients to rebuild, there was not, there was no water a bit available from the municipal water supply either by pump or or accessibility. Um, the other thing that was interesting in, in this fire, <clears throat> our pool was drained three times by by helicopters. Um, it was 
not a pool that I necessarily had thought would be effective for that purpose. But um, other pools were drained and f filled into our pool um, so that the size of the pool might even be something if you had a pool that is one of the best defenses that you could have. It's a large volume of water, a very simple gas pump, um, some of the best pumps are actually Australian pumps that are, are quite effective on a cart, ready to go, tremendous ability. Now, if you mix that with a Class A biodegradable foam, you've then increased the ability for the moistness to stay where embers would sit in essentially a foam, uh, at least for several hours um, when that ember fire starts, whereas water could evaporate very, very quickly. The, so using a pool or a body of water, both for cistern or collection or recreation, is probably one of the best defenses that you can have uh, for water. Excellent. Excellent. Ah, there we go. Excellent. Thank you. And several people have talked about using sprinklers. Only use sprinklers if you have dedicated water for that. Do not turn on the water and leave your house because then there's no water for everybody else and for the firefighters. Very, very, very important point. So the vegetation, and again, this is about how do we rethink about how we're living here in the Santa Monica Mountains. You guys are really fortunate to live here. So Cassie, tell us a little bit about how you guys are looking at that in your experience and how we can be fire escaping our properties better. Yeah, well, if there's, if there's one thing that um, everyone can take away today is that um, clearly from all the examples and integrated strategies that FireWise anything isn't a one bullet solution. So um, Jay may kill me for this, but if there was one thing I could cross out of all of the uh, clearance notices is brush clearance, because brush clearance clearly implies a one bullet solution. And we've experienced what a one bullet solution looks like with uh, the rebates during the drought. The one bullet solution was save water, save water, save water. And what we got out of that was a lot of gravel scapes, which really didn't help us as a community. And so what we need to do is we need to look at all the different strategies uh, in firewise choices an inside out thinking. It's not just one solution. And that means that all of the structural pieces that have been said today are part of a whole solution. And then we step out into the landscape and we look at our very first five feet of defensible space. It's clean, we've discussed that. It's maintained year round. Um, there's not clutter, there's not leaf litter, there's not doormats, the gutters are clean, the vents are the right size so that embers don't go into the attic or the basements. And then we get outside of that five feet of defensible space and we don't need to be barren. We actually can fire, follow the fire code and we can put landscaping. Now what is that landscaping? Is it exotic plants from the Mediterranean? Is it invasive plants? I believe that man landscaping is native foliage because we are in a drought. Native foliage is the most adapted to our dry, hot summers. They hold their moisture. They take less water. They have some other benefits that aren't part of this discussion tonight, but we all benefit from native plants. Now, what does that look like? It looks like native plants that are very low to the ground, that are spaced properly, that are not planted for instant gratification. Because if we plant for instant gratification, we're going to kill ourselves trying to maintain when the fire inspectors come. We want well-spaced planting. We can have native shrubs that are also well-spaced and limbed up properly to meet the fire code. And we can even have trees trees that are spaced far away and far enough away from the house that provide shade and also protect us when embers come in from two to three miles away and they act as a catcher's mitt, which can actually save our home. So counterintuitive to our thinking, natives, while they are talked about as being adapted to fire, what that truly means is that they they come back after fire. And one of the things that protects us later 
is that those native plants protect our slopes from slides and floods and erosion. So we're getting bookended with protection when we think about using natives to landscape, to save water, to meet the fire codes, the spacing, to reduce our maintenance, to have a beautiful environment. And then if we are, if, if a fire comes through, we still have those plants that are deep rooted and are holding and knitting our slopes together to protect us from floods. And the last piece is that we want to actually irrigate our plants in fire areas so that we can keep the soil moisture higher and cooler. Soil moisture content is key to keeping an area cool and in the summer heat, we can't take a native plant, set it and forget it. That's not how to maintain a safe, uh, moist landscape. That's, that's the quick. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. That's the ecological perspective of, of why and how to use native plants. Jay, in less than a minute, can you tell us from a firefighter perspective how that landscape helps you to defend a property? Um, well, it's again, it's all the layers, not a single solution, but uh, you describe it beautifully for us to have a space to come into your home and not being compromised. So your home being compromised will be the first thing. And I'm going to give you a quick example. I did it with my house. I bought this house from a beautiful couple that was there for many years, and they have everything on top of the house. I mean, bougainvilleas, we had uh, uh, jacarandas, and all you can think of. Um, one of the first things we did is to create three foot space around the hut and have cement from the wall out. Um, and then reduce all the vegetation around as much as we could. One benefit of that is uh, my first insurer was, uh, I live against the mountains in the um, San Gabriel Mountains. So my first insurer was the California Fair Plan. There's nothing fair about the Fair Plan. Uh, and in my first bill was $7,000. Um, so but when, after completing all that work, my bill went down from $7,000 to $1,500. But the, the coronation of this whole thing came down when uh, my neighbor is a uh, retired LA City uh, chief, and then I'm next door and then some other people. Um, but when the fire was happening, I was at the base, uh, the station fire that is, uh, I was at the fire base, so I knew that the fire was gonna hit my home. I asked for permission to go get my stuff. I have two boxes that I take with me, whatever. So when I got two boxes, but to my delighted surprise, those guys not knowing that a fire person living in that home, there was an LA City fire engine with hoses around my house um, trying to protect the neighborhood. And I asked him, why do you do that? And they said, because we feel safe right here. Um, so that's the whole idea. We want to come home, we want to save you home, but uh, like you want to get cops, you put donuts on the front of the house. Um, for us, give us that space that we can work around it and, and, and there'll be a great thing to do. So any, any law enforcement, I'm sorry. No, I'm Thank you, Jay. So we have about 10 or 15 minutes for questions for this very illustrious and experienced panel. Go ahead in the back and please stand up. Um, um, we stayed after, we did not evacuate, and one of the things that we were doing constantly for days after was trying to put out the fires in the creosote railroad ties. Is there any plan for Malibu to ban them? Uh, Currently there's not, but I think that's something that we can consider in working with the fire department and the city biologists and stuff and look at all of that. Um, I would encourage you to come in and see us at City Hall so we can discuss that and get the particulars. It's something of interest and we, we definitely are interested, but we need to research further. And, and, and with that, um, mulch, tree shavings that dry out and turn into kindling. So that's the other thing that was burning all the time and sending up embers for days later. So those, those two things are really controversial here because everybody has railroad ties and mulch around their house. So something that's going to be very delicate of a topic. Do you think we can do something? I, I certainly think we can look into it and hopefully achieve that. That's something, again, it's coordinating all these things with the fire department, landscaping and everything else, but we can certainly look at that. And I think we may see some statewide direction on that. That first five feet, bark, no, bad, way bad. That's kindling. Just, just one thing with mulch, there's benefits and it, 
So it's all about placement. So you have a, a bougainvillea, for example, and I keep hampering bougainvillea, I'm sorry. Uh, but it's getting out of control, it's right next to your window. That is when it's gonna compromise your home. So mulch that is, goes all the way to the side of your house, not good. Having those five foot of space and have it separated. You can have areas that nothing grows for whatever reason. You have a, a plant that is uh, creating difficult aspect in there. Choices of mulch is, is important. So rubber mulch, no. Um, wood mulch, compacted and moist in a separate area might be okay. So we can work with you and the best selection in there. Um, the exclusion of everything, trying to just remove everything um, is not the best way to go. So working around what you have is important. Yeah, and just to follow up with Jay on the mulch aspect, um, one of the things I had talked about is tree cover and irrigation. And both of those combined are going to create a cooler environment and the moisture coming from the soil actually, if you've ever picked up mulch that's had uh, two or three days to settle in and is in an irrigated landscape, it becomes a moist block of organic matter that isn't actually, you wouldn't actually choose that at a campsite to start a fire. So it is quite circumstantial um, how the mulch works and, and how it, it is in context with the landscape. And nothing flammable within three to five feet, please, sir. My question is to Greg George. In, in reality, we talk about all how to protect to protect houses that are built out of wood, out of combustible material. Yes. Not that we build our houses by code out of wood, but we also dress it up with hundreds of pounds of different chemicals, tar, insulation, windows, paint, and all that stuff. And you're telling me now, go back five feet and you thin the trees and all that, none of that work. The crook of the issue here, the problem is that the building code, the culture that uh, all of your engineers and architects are educated by building and designing out of wood construction. That has to change. How many times, how many fires, how many lives, how many uh, broken homes and, and dreams has to occur before that? I learned the American uh, story when I was, before I came to America 50 years ago, mm -hmm. in, the, in the classic American literature about the little piglet that built out of their house, out of <laughs> and the wolf came and blew the, the, the straw away and they ate the kids, and the second time out of wood, same again, until she learned how to, to build their wood, their house out of stone and, and mud and sustain the fire, in this case, the fire. You know, your duty, not to adopt the minimum of LA County, your duty is to build based on the conditions that exist here, which is, should be minimum, non-combustible exterior and roof material. Minimum, at minimum, not less, and not a stock over wood. Thank you, you need to consider that seriously. And we will, but um, I think that your misunderstanding codes are minimum. It doesn't restrict you to the type of materials you have to use, if I may. Only with wood construction. Look at your textbooks, at your tables, all of that. Is, is, is the whole culture needs to change. It needs to start from a city like Malibu, where we live in a fire. Uh, no, I understand what you're saying, but it's it's not a code demand. It's a mindset that the uh, Southern California is built out of wood. That's just a mindset. It's not a restriction. Mike, Michael, can you stop, please? Um, I do understand what you're saying, but the code doesn't say you have to use wood construction. Uh, it is it does, addresses it if you do, but there's other materials, and people should, in fact, consider other materials when constructing. It does not restrict you to wood structures only. There are metal structures. We built metal houses in Malibu. We built concrete houses in Malibu. There's been a number of other types of construction, and as people start to rebuild, they should think about those products. They aren't restricted to wood. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think that, you know, the challenge is, is that we are in the middle of a paradigm shift and we're all struggling with it. And there's a reason why the Mediterranean is built out of non-combustible homes. So 
we're probably going to get there. The question is, how soon are we going to get there? Sir. Uh, this is for Craig Lapsley and maybe a follow-up from Jay Lopez. Um, there was a long tradition of, of volunteer fire departments in America that we've sort of lost in recent decades and in, and in California. And we've seen some movement back towards that in Corral Canyon, for example, they had their own fire truck, but and that was commandeered by the fire department itself. And there's some stories about that. And my partner is Aussie and I have some Aussie mates and I've heard a lot of stories about uh, community fire departments there and how they get together on weekends and train and it seems to me we have a missing link here in, in how the, the, the neighborhoods at a neighborhood level can really work that way. And I hear stories of, of utes, small utes with tanks on the back and, and really nimble vehicles that would be very helpful in the hillsides here. Can you talk about the culture of how that works and how those kind of people integrate with the bigger fire departments? Um, yes, I can. Um, so in Victoria, we've got two main fire departments. One is very similar to LA City, which is the Metropolitan Fire Brigade in Melbourne. And the second one is the Country Fire Authority, which is very similar to LA County Fire Department that looks after the peri-urban and the outer areas. The CFA, the Country Fire Authority, is a integrated fire service. It's got career staff and volunteers. And they run over 1,200 volunteer fire stations that have their own structures in their community, elected by um, the community, our community members that are trained, respond and are equipped with all the things that the career fire stations are equipped with. Um, they're probably more in the rural areas. They deal with more um, vegetation type fires, but they do protect hamlets or small townships. So they have an urban set of skills, but not to the complexity of high rise or um, industrial and so on. So, so volunteer fire brigades are uh, alive and well in all the states and territories of, of Australia. Um, and uh, volunteerism, forget a fire department, volunteerism, a community volunteer program, a Red Cross program, a Meals on Wheels program, um, a health program, whatever volunteer is a really important part of community and something we've spent a lot of time about. And we talk about the three Vs where it's about the volunteer, the person, uh, volunteering the activity they do and volunteerism, the culture. And it's really important to understand that volunteers in communities are a fundamental part of a community resilience program, of whatever they do. Now, that's a policy issue for obviously the state to talk about or, or counties or municipalities about the mix of career and volunteers, but it's a model that works. It's an empowering model. It might be a second tier of fire service that they are a reserve, um, but they certainly can do a lot of work about fire prevention activities as well as fire response. And they're also there very embedded in the community in the aftermath because they are the community. So it's there. Um, I'm not saying that that's a policy decision you have to go, but we've certainly got a model that we um, are very effective in, in how we do that. Thank you. And I, once again, I don't have the mic on, but I just wanted to say that I come from Humboldt County where there are 42 volunteer fire departments, so I encourage you to look around the state because volunteerism is alive and well in a lot of fire departments. Last question, ma'am, and let's try to keep it short. I have a couple of very quick questions. One, one of your slides, you, you mentioned something about roof air conditioners. And the other question is in regard to gates. How do you deal with the length of time you have to put water in your house if you have a burning structure, which is not going to be finished in next year? So two things. I mentioned in a slide a number of things that we, we've noticed um, increasing in numbers. Air conditioners on roofs that are running that have got the wrong type of shielding can actually take embers into the air conditioner and bring a fire in through the roof of the structure. Um, I don't know whether that's relevant here, but that's certainly been a learning with us that roof mounted air conditioners um, with the wrong type of um, venting. And also we um, strongly suggest on these days that yes, it's hot and we're dealing with a hot environment. So, but, um, to turn air conditioners off is an also an important thing. So we're seeing fire being brought in through the air conditioners into the roof structure and ultimately burning the building down. So we've done all the other work, but yet the thing on the roof is the one. And I'm not sure you've got that type of air conditioner. Um, the second one is, as I said, gas cylinders, and the third one is those, you know, the fences and the other things. But they're probably more, we're seeing them more in the 
um, suburbia, so in the suburbs that have uh, that face their backyards face bushland. Uh, and the other thing about fencing, if you are in that environment where your your house is on a small block and it faces um, bushland, we've gone very strong about steel fencing. So the fire comes up, and if it comes up to a wire fence, a ring lock fence, it will come through the fence. Obviously, it will just travel straight through. If it comes up to a wooden fence, depending on the on the maintenance of the wooden fence, but they will they will ignite. Uh, and we've gone. We haven't got it in the standards as mandatory, but we've provided guidelines about selection of fences. And if you're on the outer perimeter, to have a metal fence with a concrete plinth. So it doesn't grow grass, grass along the bottom and carry the fire. Um, it actually is a solid fence to a concrete plinth, um, a foundation. Um, and that is to, if the fire comes up to it, it's a barrier. And it's a very important barrier about protecting your house. And you talk about materials, one of the ways to protect some of the wooden um, places is to put shielding of some kind that's very architect architecturally done, that you can actually shield wooden buildings, and we're doing that in the retrofit, um, that is assessing, making sure that you don't get direct flame impact up to a property, or the embers are being hit, um, are landing on something that's a solid construction and, and falling and not burning. So, so that's there. Um, and the other question... That water, which I think we'll pass on to David. I wanted to say one thing about the air conditioner and the vents. That's probably why the Kmart burned in Santa Rosa and why a lot of those homes burned up there. So the vents are key. If you have anything that's pulling air into your house, you have to have that vent, those vents, um, I'm sorry, screens on your vents to keep the embers from entering. Last word, David, on water. <clears throat> so your question was how to protect your tank, your water tank? Uh, it was, it was uh, the capacity because you gave a capacity um, for, I think, you know, the 40 minutes or whatever it takes to, for a wildfire to come, come through. But if you have an adjacent house that's burning, I understand that could go on for eight hours. How do you deal with the water? Sure. So um, we've heard 2,500 gallons. We can't hear the question. The question was, how much water do you really need, um, not only for your house, but potentially for the neighboring house that's on fire? That you might have to protect. Um, ideally, you know, every house has its own water capacity, um, and uh, but we've heard 2,500 minimum. We've heard in Australia 4,000. You know, the answer is as much water as you can possibly have. The, you know, the issue is that the reality of water is that water is not the best thing in fighting fire. Um, you know, if it's windy, if it's it, it's going to evaporate quickly. It's going to run off. The best thing I've found is that you can maximize the fire fighting effectiveness by using a surfactant like the Class A fire retardant foam. Um, I mean, many people and insurance companies have been using a, like a boss check that it is that it's mixing with water as a solution that can go on on trees and other things um, and maximize the effectiveness of water because it's unlikely that if you're going to leave the house, leave everything on, that you're going to have enough pure water. The pool, again, is a tremendous source of water if you have a pool, if you have a, uh, a fountain. Uh, cisterns are, are wonderful. These, these what we found um, in this fire was that the water was also used by the fire department. It's not just used by the, the person, uh, the occupant of the house, but very much part of the support structure for the fire department itself. And having the right fittings that work with the fire department is very important. There are confusing number of fittings. Um, and so having the right fittings so that a fire department can come with a dry standpipe to connect to your water source can be very, very helpful because they could use their pumper and they can then fight other fires adjacent as well. Thank you, and I think this is a perfect segue into our next panel, and your question was about how much water do I need to have to protect my house if my neighbor's house is on fire and it's gonna keep burning? And I think the answer is, coming back to what Craig's talking about, is it's working with your neighbors ahead of time so that your neighbor's house is not gonna catch your house on fire and vice versa. And so, as we get ready to move into that panel, I'd like to thank our esteemed panelists here. And I believe they will be available for questions afterwards. If you need, we're not going to take a break. If you need to use the facilities, get some food, drink, please go ahead and do that. And if our next panelist could come on up. 
Um, I believe there's also literature out back um, for you to get information. I come from the California Fire Safe Council. We're all about supporting communities to work together and create fire resilient communities. So we're gonna hear about some local models for that. Um, but yeah, it's a perfect question. It's like we have to be working with our neighbors to make sure that we're both gonna survive the fire. So our, this panel is focusing more on how do we work as a community and how do you as individual residents fit into that community in terms of everybody surviving the next fire. And um, I'm going to let you guys introduce yourself. Who do we have as our first? Scott, go ahead, please. Um, hi, Scott Ferguson. I guess I need this thing here. Great. Um, I'm Scott Ferguson. I'm the board chair of Topanga Coalition for Emergency Preparedness, better known as TSEP. Um, hopefully a lot of you people know who we are, but if you don't, uh, TSEP was born out of the aftermath of the 93 Old Topanga Fire um, because of a lack of communication, a lack of good information that came uh, from local uh, TV and local news organizations out of that fire. I experienced that personally when um, that fire broke out about 18 months after I had built my home in Topanga. So I evacuated when I was sitting in my in-laws house in North Hollywood watching the news. I heard them mention my street and I basically sat there and said, okay, my house is gone. So I started figuring out how I could redesign it when I put this light switch over here instead. I was, I was rebuilding my house in my, uh, in my head. Turned out that was just uh, wrong information and a lot of people got that kind of wrong information. So a few people in Topanga got together and said, we need to create an organization made up of local people who know the area that could gather an, uh, accurate information and put that out to the community. So TSEP has been doing that for the last 25 years. Um, during um, incidents like the Woolsey Fire, our volunteers activated and worked nine days straight to stay in communication with LA County Fire and Sheriff and all of the agencies that were fighting that fire and putting out incident updates on social media, on our telephone hotline and on our website on um, an ongoing basis, maybe every 30 minutes or so. We were, we were watching that the whole time. And the other thing we do um, when there's not a fire, which is thankfully 99% of the time is blue skies and beautiful, is help educate the community on emergency preparedness and try to get that, that community thing together that's been the, the crux of what we've been talking about here of working together from the individual on out. So the individual doing their own thing and then the immediate neighbors getting together and working together and then the community at large. Uh, you're fortunate in Malibu to have a city government that's um, really listening and trying to change policies. In Topanga, we don't have that. We don't have a government, so we rely on all on our volunteer organizations, of which we have many. Thank you, Scott. And Beth, is another Topanga resident. So I'm Beth Burnham, and I'm co-president of the North Topanga Canyon Fire Safe Council. And indeed, my other, my co-president, Ryan Allied, is sitting behind me, uh, or behind us there. Um, so we are the newest of the emergency preparedness volunteer organizations in Topanga. We were met each other through the creation of the Santa Monica Mountain CWPP, Community Wildfire Protection Plan. And so along with TSEP, we have Arson Watch and CERT in, in Topanga, all volunteer organizations. Our organization focuses on long-term community-based pre-fire, pre-wildfire preparation. And so our goal is to lessen the, Im the severity of the wildfire emergency, the loss of life and structure, and in the process help Topanga become a fire-adapted community. And so what is a fire adapted community? And I've ha asked them to put this map up here because this is um, the fire frequency and, re and return interval map for the Santa Monica Mountains. So if the colors are red and into almost black, they're high, high frequency returns, as frequent as every six years. So Malibu is, is gonna have fires. So we know the Santa Monica Mountains are all gonna burn but Malibu burns really, really frequently, and this is where you live. So 
Our orientation is to say, we need to adapt to that because that map is our reality. And we do that by becoming informed and prepared and collaboratively planning and taking action to safely coexist with this fire. And so my takeaways are that we need to understand the role and the behavior in fire in our landscape, that fire authorities are not gonna be there and so to save our homes. And so we have to take on the mitigation responsibility to understand what we can do to, res to reduce that impact of wildfire on our home and reduce the loss of life and property. Thank you, and thank you both for being community volunteers and leaders in Topanga Canyon. Craig, can you tell us a little bit about the model in Australia and the community versus individual responsibility <coughs> side of this? Um, yes, I can, and um, it's works in progress, but from 2009, we, as I've indicated, we learnt that it is time to empower communities, and empower is an interesting word, but have a structure that allows them to own what they need to own. Local knowledge is critical. Um, we would go to these types of debriefs and we would hear from community to say, you didn't engage us, we had solutions, we knew. And others were coming in and dealing with fires and floods that didn't know it. So how do you get the knowledge that you have got as community members to be effectively put in? The day of the fire or the flood is too late. It needs to be done prior, so it needs a structure. One thing we have done, and we talked about it yesterday with the planning um, policy people, was we've set up legislation now that a municipality always needed to have an emergency management plan, but underneath that, in legislation of, two, of 2020, so it's next year, um, we will see a community plan be part of the legislation. Doesn't mean every community would have a plan, but if I looked at that map that Beth just put up, it would be obvious that in a fire sense, there is, re there is frequency of fire and intensity of fire that it would be a good idea for a community to have something more than the authorities have got about what you do, how you behave, but in the preparedness side of it, the prevention side of it, how do you influence? And community's powerful, particularly if it's organised. If it's structured and it's got a proper um, structure to it, it's recognised, and I'm hearing here that the, the municipalities, the counties want to have these um, relationships, but to some of these, it's foreign to them. So you need to put structures around it. And, and it won't work if it's top down. It won't work because the mayor or someone from Australia come along and said, it's a great idea. It's got to be driven from the people in the community. It's empowering about the people of the community to do it. And there's ways to do it. Everyone's different, every community's different, every, every community's got a different risk, a different hazard, got different profiles, it's got different people, it's got different capabilities, it's got a different intellect. But you know what? What you have got in common is people with passion and they want to do things. So it's about structure. And, uh, and I think I've, I've listened um, to Beth and, and Scott a couple of times now um, over the last few weeks on telephone tele um, conferences and I've had a look at their information and it works for them. That's not to say it's going to work for Malibu or another community, but the framework is the stuff that will make it work. Yeah. And, and I think it's then about being supported and, and, it's, and I don't think it's a lot of money. There might be some seed funding required. It's the, it's the process of connecting people and understanding what's important to the people to want to fix. You know, and I've heard he, tonight you know, issues that you've got questions to. Sometimes the discussion will resolve the question because you'll have it as a community. So, so I, I think it's powerful. We've done a lot of work on it. We've seen it work, but it, it can't be on the day. It's got to be planned to be part of it. And I talk about a simple thing I mentioned before, the before, during and after. The before is the critical part. The during is, the, you know, it's, uh, it's happening. The flood, the fire, the storm. The aftermath is where the communities come back into the league with their own, absolutely. Thank you. So Beth, you've done a lot of community organizing around this. How do you, I know you started, helped start the Topanga, North Topanga Fire Safe Council, and you've actually helped start other fire safe councils. How do people start? Where do you begin? And then what happens? So right now, um, I'm working with probably four communities in Malibu. And another couple of communities in the Palisades have reached out to me. And the thing that is most important to me is we are all, we are all in the same community. The fire doesn't know, these bound, know the boundaries. Um, and so together, I, there's nothing I want to do more than take the knowledge that we've created in Topanga and move it on out to my 
neighbors in Malibu and in the Palisades. So one thing was last night, Ryan and I were up at um, Ramba, Ramba Pacifico, up at Camp 8, presenting a program that we've created, which is called, Will Your Home Survive When the Embers Arrive? <laughs> and it's, and it's, um, you know, it's an hour, hour and a half presentation. Um, and from that and with that, we also created in Topanga a program, and Scott is part of this program, where we'll come to your house and walk around and do an evaluation of your house and talk to you about what you can do to make your home more resistant to the ember storm that's always associated with a wildland fire. Well, we're allowed to say that 50% of the homes that burn in a wind-driven fire are ignited by embers. Um, I'm also hearing numbers that sound a lot more like 75, 80, 85% of the homes never see the actual flames. And so there's a lot. There is so much that can be done at an individual level to save your home, to make your home ember resistant, and therefore make your neighbor's home safer, and they make their home more ember resistant, and you become a community that's much more ember resistant, and the fire can actually be flowed around your house. And that's really, really our goal. And so that's what we're working towards. Thank you. So Scott, TSEP is, I, you guys are way up high on a pedestal for me. I, I, like I said, when I got to work here to see the work that you were doing and how far ahead of the curve you guys were back then, 10 years ago, and now to see your very cool binder. So maybe talk a little bit about kind of what it, what, <laughs> if you don't have one of those binders, you definitely want to get one of those binders. And I think Malibu needs to be creating its own version of that binder. It might be creating its own version. Malibu might be, yeah, Malibu. The Malibu Foundation might be working on this right now. Yeah. So if you're interested in being part of creating the cool Malibu binder, talk to these guys afterwards. So tell us about, you know, what do you guys do on a day-to-day? -day? You, you're like there on the ground, every single house, and people really know who lives where and who's got what animals and who's got this and that. What's that look like for you guys? How do you do that? Yeah, a lot of that is, um, comes out of a program we call Neighborhood Networks. Um, and that's just that idea that w w if, if all of this resilience starts with the individual and the things that you can do as, as your own self, um, it then behooves you to get your immediate neighbors on the same page. So the way, to, the way we do that in Topanga is, is we help neighbors um, get together to form this neighborhood network where they meet, they make sure they know each other, they share contact information, uh, they may share um, special knowledge they may have. You might learn that you've got a neighbor who's a doctor, a nurse, or a, um, a mental health professional, or, or something like that. And you get to know people and build a communication tree so that you can communicate with them in a quick way if there's a disaster that strikes. And to do that ahead of time gives you a lot of peace of mind because when a bad thing happens, there's nothing worse than feeling like you're going through it alone. But if you've got a number of people that you know have your back and you've already met with them and they've already agreed, hey, this is a good idea and we're gonna, we're gonna work on this together, then it's much easier to get through something like um, a big fire. So that's, that's one thing we do, um, is encouraging that. Um, the other thing is just having meetings and, and, uh, like this and talking to people about um, all the kind of emergency prep stuff that you can, you can do. The people in TSEP, the key stakeholders in TSEP have um, sort of made it their life's work to study this stuff. I mean, I, I've been personally studying this now for 25 years, and I just, I just soak up everything. I read everything I can about fire behavior, about fire response, about community involvement. And we really kind of consider ourselves professional volunteers. None of us get paid, um, but boy, as Craig said about the passion, there's a tremendous amount of passion in Topanga. And again, because it's a community that doesn't have this sort of central government, and they don't, we don't have an authority that sort of lords over us a little bit and that we can turn to, we have to just do it ourselves. But the idea of doing that stuff yourself is something you can still bring to a city like Malibu that does have a government because, as we've heard, the government's not going to solve all your problems. You're going to have to figure it out for yourself. I mean, if, you, if you're in a position where you can do the stuff yourself, then any help you get from the government agencies and the elected officials and the um, first responders and all that is just on top of that, and that's great. 
Thank you. So during the fire, let's talk about where the community fits in then. And Beth, I'd like you to, you mentioned certs. I'd like you to explain that and what a cert is and how they work. And then Scott, maybe you can also tell us afterwards what TSEP does during the fire. And then Craig, I'd like to hear about how you guys deal with it in Australia. Okay, so CERT is um, Community Emergency Response Team. It's a national program. Um, I was trained by Brad Davis, who used to work in the city of Malibu in Topanga, um, and decided that CERT wasn't for me. I'm not a medical person. So I know, I've been through the training, I know the process, but um, that fire and fire emergencies were more my thing. Um, was the reality there. Um, the other hat that I wear is once an event happens, I'm my neighborhood network coordinator. Ryan is his neighborhood network coordinator. Scott is, uh, are you still your neighborhood network coordinator? Yeah, I think so. yeah, on top of everything else. And so we change hats. So my fire safe council hat is long term pre fire event preparation. But in an event, I'm wearing a different hat. Yeah, and during, during an event, that's when TSEP really kind of. Um, jumps into action and, and I'm always amazed at the amount of dedication and time that our volunteers are willing to spend to bring updated, accurate, verified information to the public. Um, we've, over the years, since we've been doing this for 25 years now, we've, we've built a pretty sophisticated communications network. We've built tremendous relationships with LA County Fire and sheriff and all of the agencies, they know us, they trust us, they know we're not wild and crazy people that are gonna go do something stupid. So we're able to get our people embedded into the command post and understand exactly what's going on in real time and then report back to the rest of our um, volunteers. And that enables us to gather accurate information, unlike the information you might find on nextdoor.com or someplace where people are just talking. Um, we strive to make sure it's the correct kind of information. Um, but what we'll do is we'll, we'll give that information out to our network, uh, neighborhood network coordinators who can then disperse it to their neighbors through whatever communication channel they may have set up. Most of our um, neighborhood networks have set up their own mass notification system through uh, the commercially available um, websites out there. There's two of them. One, one is called One Call Now, and the other is Call Em All. And these are services that you can subscribe to where you just put everybody's phone number into, uh, into this system, and one person, if it's the neighborhood network coordinator or some other person in that network, can get some verified information. They can make one phone call and ring everybody's number. It's just like the Alert LA system, only small, and you control it yourself. So that works really well to help disperse information quickly because as we, uh, as we talked about earlier and as Craig mentioned, you know, information is king. If you've got good information, you can make good decisions and then you get better outcomes. And if you have bad information, the opposite happens. So we're all about trying to keep good information going and I think um, other places are starting to get a little bit of an interest in building something that is similar to TSEP on a smaller scale for that reason, just to be able to get communication out to people because um, no, there's nothing worth it, worse in a disaster than not knowing what's going on. And we all experienced that in Woolsey because when that fire started and the power went out and there was no power, we all suddenly went, wait, our phones, our TV, our internet, our cell phones, all this stuff requires electricity. And the electricity went out and suddenly everybody was in the dark and nobody knew what was going on. They didn't know there were evacuation orders. There, and, and that's a panicky feeling. So we're trying to educate people in how to be resilient on every level, even when the power goes off. So what, what do you do when the power goes off? What, what kind of backup do you have? That's stuff that all has to be figured out ahead of time. Thank you. A couple of examples. Um, one, we've got uh, structured community fire guard groups, which are community-based groups that look at their fire prevention and preparedness within their community. They could be a street, so it might be 14 houses that come together with a coordinator, and uh, they are programmed as a structured group that are provided by their fire authority and the municipality support and information for them to function. It's very much about fire preparedness. However, 
and there's probably three levels of them. Um, the highest level is one that would be more able to take physical actions when a fire is in their area. And this is about f small fires starting, not the big one that's coming, you know, miles away. Um, so that's there. We've also got other examples that are broader than fire. So where we've got, and the town that I talked about that lost 168 ha homes on Christmas Day 2015, um, they had a, a, a community plan that did very similar to what Scott talked about. It, it, it listed everyone that was in the town, it, it gave their profession, it gave their background. So all of a sudden it might be Mary who has been a nurse but currently isn't a nurse is um, something to do in health services. But it lists those things and it asks them, and th this is a community that doesn't have an ambulance in the community that has to travel in. It's got a fire station, a volunteer fire station. It's got a pub and a general store but it's got... Um, uh, it's a holiday village and there's a lot of people going in and out on weekends that are Melbourne-based that travel in there. And it's almost this thing of how people get connected and understand each other. So this, it, it's actually a social fabric that allows people to interact and share knowledge, but when something's not happening that's, that's planned for, they have roles to play. And it's coordinated back by about three people. Um, they use SMS, well-planned out, well-structured, um, they talk about if, if an event of significance, it's on the coast, so if it was, um, you know, a, a drowning, a number of drownings on the coast with life-saving, but they've got scenarios of what is likely to happen in their community. But the thing that I love about that, their starting point was the values of why they live there. So they, they talked about they love the coast. They talk about they live there because of the bush. And when you write those values down, they're the things that they collectively protect and collectively talk to the agency about how to improve. So oh, we've just done a, a, a significant amount of work with that community, and one of the things, they wanted a walking track back into the bush. And so we went in and actually sponsored it. And, and you know, they, they waited for this for 20 years. And we said, like, this is the livability of this community, and it was so important, but no one would listen. So we did it post-fire. We said, look, you, you've got to get something out of this. You've had a terrible event. What's something that you've never had before that's really important. And they came up with all these ideas and we ended up doing the, this walking path. <coughs> that has got that much energy in the community because we supported them externally with something that otherwise wasn't there. And it matched their values. It matched the recreation and, and, and their flora and fauna values. So it was quite deep about the values of the community, about why people live there and then what and what they're dealing with in the hazard or the risk about bushfire or other things. So, so I've got a community fire guard example that's all about fire and I've got this other example that's about a community that's understanding the values of what they live there, the things they protect, um, the importance of what they're protecting and then the threats that they face. Really, really strong. Fantastic, actually. Thank you. That's very powerful. And we're going to open it up in just a moment for questions. And I wanted you each to wrap up with an example of one of your most favorite or inspiring or, or a way that you have used um, that if somebody here wants to get something going in their community, where do you start? And there are so many different ways to do it. So I'm going to let you guys go in the order you choose. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've spent the last 25 years running, organizing community organizations, and it's much harder to run a community organization than it is to run a business. And it's because everyone is being asked to give absolutely their most critically valuable resource. It's, their, it's, uh, it's our time. It's our personal time, taking it away from our family um, and making a commitment to something. And so as someone running that organiz those organizations, asking that of my volunteers, and every single one of, those volu of my volunteers has their own personal agenda for doing it. I've got to make sure that I'm meeting the needs of that agenda and together pulling together people with different agendas and different ability to commit time, to meld them together to create a successful organization. So I'm a big believer in this. I think that the, the Australia model demonstrates that it's what makes um, us be able to live in these beautiful places that burn. Um, but we have, to, we have to change our mindset on how we live here. 
and our commitment to how we live here. And so having said that, I'll say, call me. <laughs> yeah, from the standpoint of um, speaking about TSEP specifically, um, it required tremendous commitment on the, on the part of a group of about six or seven residents who were willing to just go that extra mile and put in that kind of legwork to get the thing going. Um, and, and the people that are running it now are also just, it's just amazing to me. That we, we all have jobs, you know, I mean, we're, we're not retired. We, we have careers and, and real jobs. Um, and it's, it's hard to find that kind of commitment and passion. I mean, it, it's difficult. So what I, what I would say is start small. You just take baby steps. I mean, you do one little thing at a time. If, if you as an individual can just say, you know what, I'm just going to talk to the neighbor on either side of me, and we're going to just kind of talk about this and say, hey, let's get some buy-in, and then grow it out from there. Don't think like you have to do it all at once. Um, just, just try to build it out a little bit. And I think what you'll find is that you'll find that there are people around that are those sort of leader types that will step up and and say, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And once they start to see the value in it. But it's, um, it's, it's as, De as Beth said, it's hard to get people to put in that kind of time. The one thing I will say is that after a big disaster like this fire, you find people much more willing to do that. They, they suddenly, it's real to them. It's no longer a concept. Um, I mean, the, just, just the, the trivial way to describe that is from TSEP's Twitter page. When we have a disaster like this, at the end of the Woolsey fire, there were, we had 1,500 more followers than we did nine days earlier. And that was just because people started to get word of the information we were putting out. And they're going, oh, we need, to, we need to know this. So they just, that, that kind of activism will, will come out of the disaster. And that if there's ever a good thing that comes out of a disaster, it's the way people come together and really start to behave in a different manner than they did beforehand. It sort of takes your innocence away. Thank you. And Craig, can you wrap it up in two minutes? Uh, I can. Um, and I'll go straight off, Scott. Seize the opportunity. You, you've had something that's impacted you. It's impacted your community. It's impacted all of you in some way, shape or form. Don't miss the opportunity to come together and get the strength and the commitment of community about what's important for, your, for you and your community. And the other thing, I'll go back to what Beth said. Beth talked about managing people, and everyone's got a different agenda, a different personality, a different, a different um, purpose of what they might want. That's why the values are important. Visit what's important to your community. It won't take long to do, and you don't have to lock it down. You might leave it a bit flexible for a while. What's important? Why do you live here? There's a reason you live here, because you love it. There's a reason why you live here, because it fits your lifestyle. And the bit around it is the bit you need to protect and some of those things around it, you haven't got control of. So to come together and commit means you've got a way of influencing it. This is about leadership. This is about your leadership and, and staking a claim that your community is so, so important. And I, and I know there's people in this room that have got the ability to do it. And someone's mentioning. And the last thing I'll say is make it fun, make it social, but have a look around here Where's the 21-year-olds in the meeting tonight? So you've got to connect it into generational changes. It can't be our age groups. I'm only 32. I look a bit older. <laughs> I've had a hard life. But, but how do you do that? So how do you connect to the people that are coming up behind us that love this community and grew up in it? That's the bit. That's the generational bit that's important. We need to leave a legacy. So the community bit can't be just about us. It's got to be more than that. So that's, that's probably my closing comments. And I probably didn't do really well at that. <laughs> you did great at that. So we have time for a couple of questions. Ma'am, please stand up. Question as a comment. Uh, I think Scott mentioned the, the concept of neighborhood networks and communities. Um, the Red Cross and the CERT programs have a program called Ready um, uh, Map Your Neighborhood. 
So these are easy tools for you to actually go around your neighborhood, do an audit of where are the skills, where are the resources, where can we pack things and so on. And uh, the city of LA also has uh, adopted a kind of little sister to the Map Your Neighborhood, which is called Ryland, which is Ready Your LA Neighborhood. And uh, the resource is available online. And to piggyback on CERT, um, the Community Emergency Response Team, I really encourage people to take it because it's a free program and it's not just medical. I agree with you that the first aid and, and CPR, especially with Brad Davis, I'm sure you've taken the wilderness first aid, is a little intimidating. But it's also about reading your house, bolting your house. It's specifically more for earthquakes, but it can be adapted to fires. How to actually conduct search and rescue, how to organize your neighborhood, mm -hmm. and also how to do triage if you have to. But it's very much how to prepare your home, your family, and your very close-knit community so that you can be resilient in a time of an emergency. Thank you, and I think that CERT point is important and ties back to your volunteers in, in fire, and that the CERT team can be who's going out and being on the ground while the firefighter is actually fighting the fire. So it is a really important model. Ma'am. Yeah. Um, Craig, uh, you seem to have so much to offer us in your experience and um, uh, I, it, it looks like successes, and I'm really getting from you that the um, underlying is really about building a strong community that's intergenerational based on values. And I'm, I'm really inspired and moved by what I'm hearing from you tonight, but you had such a small amount of time to be able to speak. And I feel that, um, you know, there's a fire hose of information that we could um, uh, benefit from you. So how it, are you uh, leading any workshops by yourself? Are you uh, for um, a, available, uh, you know, as a consultant, that information you're putting up at Tree People? Um, is it easy for somebody to just take as a framework and, and begin? Um. Well, thank you, and and I do love people, and community's been the bit that I've always, you know. So I've come from fire departments, but it's always been about the people bit. Um, it's interesting. On Thursday, we're going to talk to um, three people, so Andy and Deborah, about what has come out of the last few days, um, as in yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Um, I am available. I am back in the states, um, but. You can come and visit it, visit me in Melbourne if you wish. Like you could either ring Beth and get and dro drop it around at Beth's place, or just drop it to Melbourne. That's okay. So um, yeah, no, I see that there is a lot of synergy between what we're doing in Victoria. Uh, I have come out of the job as commissioner, which means I've got an opportunity to do things differently, and I do want to. I'm a little bit older than than 32, but my accountant told me I still need to work. Um, so at 54, I can't retire, but there is there is a lot. But it doesn't have to be me. There's other people that can do this, and it can't be just a single person. Um, but I'm certainly ha happy to work through Tree People, through Malibu, LA, whoever. Um, and resilience is one of the things that is the future about how we make communities communities. And I think we've lost a bit of that. I think we've got to go back to some things that maybe are old-fashioned, old hand, but we've got to modernise them to fit for the next generation that's coming behind us. And that is about um, you know, digital worlds, transformation of how we see communities working and the challenges that communities have got. So yes, so I'm around um, and we'll work through how we, how we offer some of those tools and how we support communities to, to get there. Thank you, and our last question, sir. Now this is for the uh, Topanga people and others. Uh, once you're in the fire, how do you communicate with each other once the power goes out and you have no cell phone, television, radio, other than portable and so on? How do you communicate? Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> um, that's, and we don't have enough time to really go through all of that, but from, from the standpoint of TSEP volunteers, we've built uh, a pretty sophisticated ham radio network in Topanga with our own repeaters. And so we can talk to each other on ham radio and relay a lot of that information. But from the standpoint of uh, everybody else, uh, that's one of the things that, um, that we're working on to try to help people have some easy forms of backup power at their homes to at least power their telecommunications routers and gear. Um, that, of course, is assuming that your telecom provider is actually providing that service. Um, we all know that in, in Woolsey, Spectrum 
their, their uh, distribution lines burned up, so their uh, service went down. So all the backup power on your telecom uh, stuff for, se for Spectrum would have gone, been for naught. But in Topanga, uh, anybody who had Frontier Fios and backup power at their home kept their internet, TV, phone, cell service going the entire time because Frontier has a distribution station in, in Topanga. It has uh, backup power. And they kept that flowing. So you can't control whether your telecom provider is giving you that information. But if they are and you've got backup, then maybe you can stay connected at least long enough to get the evacuation order and get out of Dodge. Yeah, it's, 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 it's layered. Everything is layered. If we talk about the system uh, approach to this stuff, you have to have a whole bunch of layers of things and everything ba is backed up and then there's a backup plan, there's a plan B, there's a plan C, there's a plan D. Uh, you, you've got to go down that road and have ways to get information when the power's out. AM radio, there's your, there's your, bat, your last vestige of that. Listen to CanX. Thank you, Scott. And please join me in giving these wonderful community leaders a hand. And they, they will be available for conversations in just a few minutes. And with that, I'll pass it on to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming out. Um, thank you for doing something that's really hard to do in Los Angeles, where we've become so isolated, which is showing up with an open heart and an open mind. I have a qu couple quick questions for you. How many of you have, have dependents at home, pets, maybe a parent, senior, adult, and you leave for work and there isn't somebody in the house and you've left the canyon or the neighborhood? Great, not many. Um, how many of you have had a conversation with your neighbor that says, if fire happens when I'm away, here's my key, I've learned to trust you, come and rescue the dog or help support my parents. You've had the conversations, fantastic. That's really um, what it comes down to. Let me just raise it one more step. How many of you have had the conversation that said, if the fire starts at two or three or four in the morning, there hasn't been an alert, or asleep, I smelled fire, it's coming. How many of you have gotten permission from your neighbor to wake them up? Or if they don't respond, to break a window? How many of you are secure that you won't be shot <laughs> seriously by the neighbor because you haven't had the conversation with them? Those are the kinds of decisions that people had to make in Santa Rosa at two in the morning when the fire blew into town and thousands of homes burnt, it was they only had seconds. If they hadn't had that conversation, they, the neighbors, some neighbors died because they weren't awake, awakened because they didn't have the permission. So when we're talking about this is the, the level and the depth, it's scary to talk about that, that level of vulnerability. But that's the net. So even if your power goes out, you've had the conversation. And one of the hardest things, whether it's a quake or a fire, in the early part of it, when it's getting started, if you're away at work, and you're not going to be able to get back in the canyon because the road's closed, will you have the peace of mind knowing you've had the communication with your team of neighbors and know that your loved ones will be rescued? and taken care of. That's the stuff we can do. It doesn't take money. It takes having the courage to reach out, to feel foolish, which somehow it's not foolishness. But that's what we're talking about, what the organization actually does and um, what we can all do. And there are guides and hopefully we'll be sharing it all. So thank you for connecting um, and stay tuned. We hope to uh, be one of the spark plugs that helps keep spreading this, uh, celebrating your strength. And I think we have a word from the mayor. Thank you. you guys think I'm on? Now it's working. What a great panel, informative. I learned a lot. I hope the community of Malibu learned a lot. Uh, I just want to go off script. Here was my script. And let you know that within 30 days of my house being lost, getting out of the hospital, I worked with a, our planning commissioner, Craig Marks, 
and we created a cut and paste of TCEP. So if you look at what they have provided, this is their second version. Okay. This is TCEP's second, second try. I called the first one hippies with homes. <laughs> so this is, <laughs> okay. They have done a terrific job. And so I'm one of these guys that can't create a lot, but when I see something, I know how to cut and paste. So we started the plan that I have created with Chris Marks because I couldn't create it with council members because that might be a Brown Act violation. We started, your ending area is Topanga and PCH. Is that District 9, uh, 8 or 9? Yes, okay. Zone 9. Okay, so Zone 9. So I started with Chris Marks, Zone 10 being from Topanga up to Big Rock. We found the ROEs, the right of entries, in large areas where we could have people congregate in a panic. And the one thing we never thought about when we were going through this earlier was what happens when this happens on a big attendance beach day. So we created, once again, with the Topanga TCEP concept, then we went from Big Rock to Dukes, big parking lot at Dukes. Dukes, we went up to Civic Center, Carbon area. From there, we went up to Latigo Corral, where we found big pieces of real estate that we could turn into flat parking areas or congregation areas for people that are coming down out of the canyons. Point Doom, we now have Heathercliff property. We went up to Trancus, big parking lots there at the mall. And then we went up to Leo. So that plan has already been organized, latitude and longitudes, fuel load, proximity to hydrants and hammerheads for those guys in the badges. So we integrated a lot of this with the, sh with the sheriff's understanding. And anybody's welcome to look at that. I can email it to you, or we can talk about it. But because of what went on here this evening, I feel confident that the city will come through and give you something similar to this, which I brought up at a council meeting more than two months ago. And um, hopefully we'll get our act together, as they did in Topanga. And I think their second shot at it is the best one that we're going to copy is with the pages that come and go. And then to get the young people into it, online, doing, I don't know, rap songs to it. I mean, <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get the young folks. And I saw a few of the faces in here. I see one in back, Keegan, a few of them. To get the, the, the multi-generational effectiveness of this involved with the young folks, as you mentioned, Craig. So rest assured, we're, we're looking forward to this. I'll be here after this for the conversation with the people from the Palisades about the controlled burns. But once again, this panel was so informative and so perfectly situated for what Malibu needs. And I thank all of you for attending. And thank you once again for being such a great audience and listening to this and coming up with great questions. Thank you very much. I'll be here afterwards. All right. I just want to thank Tracy for um, being here and doing such a great job. Tree People staff and all the speakers who volunteered uh, and are speaking tomorrow night in, uh, in Calabasas. And that one sold out too. Uh, but this is community. And we're really happy to be sharing this spirit of our lives with you. Thank you. Drive safe. Be safe. Have a great evening.